welcome. Uh, I think we have lost the the combat with the nice weather. So we had uh, about 30 people, I think, who <laughs> subscribed and many. Uh, but you are here, so I'm glad you are here. Um, my name is Hilke Heijmans. I uh, do a lot of things. I was at EDPS before and now I work, do things for different organizations and part-time for the Pri Brussels Privacy Hub. And that's my role here. Uh, we started a series which we called Meet the Author to give the Privacy Hub a bit an academic part as well. Really, it's uh, the more academic part of the, of the Privacy Hub. Um, we do this four times a year, uh, bringing practic practitioners to and, and academics together. Four times a year, this is the third, third session in the series. We will have another se session end of June with Professor Graham Greenleaf from Australia, who is here for a few weeks, and he will he will do a, we will do one of his articles then. Um, the big challenge today is, of course, that uh, the weather is too good, but. I said that already. We have today a fantastic uh, article from a, an excellent scholar, Maya Burkan, who is now in Maastricht, but she had a nice CV and she was, she was a referent there at the European Court of Justice before, which is always a good uh, recommendation, I would say. And uh, so she brings together uh, also EU law and data protection. Her portfolio, when I when I looked at it this morning, is quite interesting. It ma makes it also ma made it also difficult to to choose the right subject because on the one hand I see that Maya is interested in constitutional issues, on real legal constitutional EU constitutional issues, and on the other hand also in the challenges of our information society. So today we will talk more about constitutional things and not so much about artificial intelligence or automated decision making, but that's for another time maybe. Uh, I know she's also interested in agriculture because she writes a lot about onions. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, as a, I, like, I, I, I must say I was very happy to have this constitutional side. It's, uh, it's an important issue. We will talk about the essence of fundamental rights today, which is really a uh, of course, a very uh, high-level subject, but we want to keep it to keep it with a practical approach. And we also know that the essence of fundamental rights became much more important, especially during, because of what happened in the area of data protection, because of the Court of Justice in Schrems mentioning uh, the essence of the fundamental right to privacy and also the fundamental right to uh, have an effective remedy before a court. Uh, Today we have an excellent uh, discussions as well. Christopher Kuhner, director of the Privacy Hub and known by all, of course, no, no introduction needed, I would say. Uh, he has a link with mainly uh, what happens in the wider world, the external aspects of EU law, but also, and then I thought about when we talk about the essence of fundamental rights, his interest for humanitarian action makes it also uh, clear that fundamental rights, the essence of it, are, are important. Uh, on the other side of me is the other Chris, Christopher Doxy, who was so kind to step in at the last, last moment. We had another speaker who worked, Herke Kranenborg, who works for the Legal Service of the European Commission, but the European Commission had more important stuff to do, I'm afraid, than be here. So we miss him, but we have an excellent replacement. Uh, Chris Doxy was before at the EDPS, was the director of the EDPS, and he also was a member of the legal service of the Europe European Commission, so we couldn't have a better replacement for Herke. Uh, and he published also on fundamental rights, especially Article 7 and 8. Um, the program will be that uh, the two discussants will first uh, uh, give their views and then Maya will react on what is being said. But I will not start before abusing my own privilege of having the floor by uh, mentioning a few, uh, four, four points which I would like to make here. Um, essence is a very high notion. We have already, we have normal rights in EU law, we have fundamental rights, and then we have the essence of fundamental rights, so that's really the most important there is. Uh, Maya tried to uh, connect uh, 
this high-level notion with application in practice in her article. Uh, and what I found quite interesting is to see how she, how the, let's say, the essence in objective terms and the essence in subjective terms, how that, how that should work. So we have an essence for the whole society, for everyone, but there should also be a kind of essence only for one right holder. I'm curious how this will work in practice. An example could maybe be, I take, took that from the Schrems case, that there is an essence to the right to an effective remedy. So if one individual does not have a remedy at all to go or to a court, maybe the essence of, of the fundamental right for an effective remedy would be at stake. But that's the question which will be answered by Maya. Uh, another issue which I find always interesting is essence to the fundamental right to data protection, Article 8 of the Charter. Article 8 of the Charter is... Uh, it's not clear what the essence of this right is. The court did a kind of uh, attempt by saying that security, data security, should be the essence of the fundamental right to data protection. I'm not sure that it's the right way forward, but it's a way mentioned by the court. Because it, I think, in at least in much of the scholarship we do right now, as data protection more about fairness and not so much about security. But uh, that's also a topic for, for discussion. Uh, the essence of the fundamental right to privacy was uh, one of the main topics in Schrems. Uh, and, and the court said in Schrems, the generalized access to the content of communications is, if that happens, then the essence of the fundamental right to privacy is at stake. <coughs> but does that really work? If you see the discussions now in the relation to the e-privacy uh, regulation, where <coughs> Does this still work? Is the access which Google has to your Gmails, for instance, is that really the essence of the fundamental rights which is at stake? A question. And there's other examples, but more and more uh, the essence of the fundamental right is, 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 you can ask whether or not that, that works the way the thing that, uh, I already someone leaving. <laughs> 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 Okay. <laughs> you as well, or? No, no, that's, that's okay. <laughs> okay. We have uh, we have such a small group that I have everything uh, follow everything. Um, Don't worry. I'm, okay. worried, I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm worried. Uh, finally, um, the last question which I would like to pose is whether or not this right to essence is linked to dignity, and human dignity is the foundation of the whole charter of the fundamental rights. So maybe we can say that not all fundamental rights have an essence. You could maybe ask yourself, is there is an essence for the right to conduct a business? Is there an essence to that? Not sure. Maybe we should look a bit also at the possible hierarchy of fundamental rights, and that only fundamental rights would have a link to human dignity. Maybe there should be this notion of ethics where you cannot, uh, where, where you never can interfere with the right itself. Those were some opening remarks for discussion. Um, the order which I had in mind is not completely clear, but I think it's uh, we do it as we saw it before, so the institutional uh, uh, view comes first, and that's Christopher Doxy in this case. Thank you, Herke. Uh, just no, quick. Not Herke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm Herke today. Uh, has everybody had the chance to read the article, by the way? Oh, it's because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's it, well, I can recommend it. It's very good, 28 pages. But I, I, tried, I tried to get it. I think it was sent out yesterday. I read it yesterday. Yesterday <laughs> evening. <laughs> it was a bit late. We should have sent it before, but it was sent out in any okay. case. Well, then, what, what I'll try and do is actually build a little bit of, of, of background as well, then. And um, as, uh, as uh, Hilke said, um, my comments will be rather fresh because uh, I, uh, I stepped in uh, yesterday afternoon. So uh, I'll have the benefit of spontaneity, but perhaps not. Um, uh, the advantage of uh, deep reflection. And I'm going to talk about some of the many things I like about this article, two specific criticisms, and then a bit of background. Now, with regard to background, um, why is there a general clause in Article 52, Paragraph 1, for all the rights in the Charter, mm -hmm. rather than the method under the Convention of Human Rights, where you have uh, a justification clause in, in each right, or, or at least the most of them. And apparently the reason was that uh, when the convention looked at all these different formulations, they, they decided they just couldn't ha spend the time in discussing 
words different here or, or there. I had a look myself. Article 8 of the, of the Convention says in accordance with the law, for example, the first test, whereas Articles 9 to 11 says as are prescribed by law. So they just didn't want to get into making differences you know, uh, all over again. So you have one overriding clause in the Charter with the, with the tests um, for what can or cannot justify an interference with the, the, the rights in the, the Charter. Uh, and uh, the second reason I think that I heard that they, they wanted this general clause was the, the, the Charter rather than Convention covers social rights and there was no precedent for the wording. So we now have one wording um, in uh, Article 52, Paragraph 1. Now, why is there an essence clause in Article 52.1? Because there are two parts to it. The first sentence is uh, there must be a law, and it, it must not affect the essence of that law. And the second sentence is normal uh, proportionate necessity justification. Um, and there's an essence clause, apparently, and I, get this, I got this from this article, uh, is because um, there were... Member, lawyers in some member states for whom this is really just natural. It, it ought to be there. And you explain, Maya, that um, essence was first enshrined in Article 19, paragraph 2 of the Grundgesetz in the Federal Republic of Germany as a precaution against the excesses of the, uh, the Nazi uh, regime. And you've distinguished in your article between objective and subjective interference. Uh, and as I understand in Germany, you distinguish between abstract and concrete interference. So an abstract or an objective interference is a general problem with legislation. The legislation itself is the issue and everybody is affected. And you've discussed the case law of both the Court of Justice and the Court of Human Rights on this. Whereas a concrete interference is where there's a specific person or persons or group which are affected, not everybody. And you gave the example of a policeman shooting a suspect, which takes away rather fundamentally, the content of the right to life. And I can understand, actually, I can see the roots of wanting to prevent Nazi-type violations or concrete violations, too. And then why were so many EU countries and third countries around with the concept of essence in their constitutions? And you, you have this wonderful quote that, um, that uh, the the concept of essence has been humorously described as the most successful export of the 1949 German Constitution. And if you look at footnote 8, I found quite intriguing, that it shows that the states concerned with essence in their constitutions were, apart from Germany itself, five post-communist and two post-fascist states. And so they, these states all had in common that they had turned to democracy they had new democratic constitutions, and they looked to Germany for inspiration for this concept of essence. Um, now, what does essence mean? Um, in your article, you use images, definitions, and a test with two, two limbs. In terms of image, I really like the image of the onion, to which uh, Hirke has already uh, referred. I mean, I think it's very helpful in appreciating the grades of interference. It's also quite accurate for human rights lawyers because the deeper the interference, the more we cry, you know, the, uh, <laughs> like the peel, peel the onion. Um, and further on in the article, you actually say, you come out in favor of what you call the absolute approach, which is that it's all or nothing for essence. It's not a, it's not a variation of proportionality. It's not something that's really, really disproportionate. It's, it's, it's deeper than that, separate. And that fits your onion imagery very well. So if you think about the onion, the outside is no interference. You take away the first layer, that's a, 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 a disproportionate interference. You go deeper, it's particularly disproportionate. But then you get to the hard, indivisible core of the essence. So I, I, I do like the imagery. And I also like the definitions in your article that you, you give. I found two of them, and I think they're both good. The untouchable core or inner circle of a fundamental right that cannot be diminished, restricted, or interfered with. And then your actual proposed definition, each fundamental right has an inalienable core which cannot be impinged upon. Uh, and I also agree with your thesis that, that um, 
the concept of essence is an absolute concept rather than relative, rather than simply an extreme form of proportionality. When I was advising on law inside the Commission or the EDPS, I never went as deeply as you have, Maya, into this, but I always just assumed it was different to proportionality. And um, in the EDPS toolkit on necessity of April last year, which, which we published, you'll see that we set out a toolkit which is step by step, how to look at legality. And on page four, you'll see that the step of, uh, first step of any analysis under Article 52, paragraph one, is, having established that there's a law, if the essence of the right is, is affected, the measure is unlawful and there's no need to proceed any further with the analysis. So, um, and you put this very well on page 22, uh, essence is not an unjustified infringement. An unjustified infringement, you can have a justificatory argument, but it's not enough. But where there's interference with essence, there is no justifying argument which can exist. So I agree with all that. The one thing, one of the two things that I disagree with most respectfully um, in, in your article is your proposed test. You propose an EU test for determining interference with the essence of a fundamental right. And you do that on page 24, and you set out a test with two limbs. And you say the essence of a fundamental right is interfered with, one, if the interference with the fundamental right calls into question the existence of the fundamental right, either for a particular person or for everybody, and if overriding reasons for such interference do not exist. Um, the first limb I'm not not too critical of, except uh, the wording calls into question, I might quibble with, I might have said, it makes it impossible to exercise the right or precludes its application, because for me, it's binary um, uh, essence. It's either or. And I think on page 14, you give two examples of essence being violated, which illustrate what I mean. You say that if a person gets a decision from an authority which affects her legal status, and she has no means at all of challenging that decision, that goes to the essence of her right to an effective judicial remedy. Nothing. But then you give another example, where the right holder has a remedy for challenging the decision, but the deadline is so short that no reasonable claimant could ever be able to meet the deadline. You say that goes to the essence, but I have a problem with that because for me it is possible but very difficult. So for me that's, it's a disproportionate restriction on the right. So you see, you see we can, we can uh, disagree about this and that's why um, I would tighten up the wording to make it absolutely binary. Now, my real problem is on the second limb, where I, sim I don't see the justification for talking about overriding reasons. And the, 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 the first reason I don't see it is the wording of Article 52, Paragraph 1 itself, which has two sentences. The first sentence says, any limitation on the rights in the Charter must be provided for by law and respect the essence of those rights. First sentence. Second sentence, then, Subject to the principle of proportionality, limitations may be made. So for me, the actual drafting of the charter, uh, I don't see how overriding can, can come in. And secondly, um, again, I don't see justification playing any role in essence. And so in a, in a nutshell, what I'm saying is, if you talk about overriding reasons, I see that as justification. So, so that's why that's why um, that's what I'm um, getting at. So I don't think there's any possibility to outbalance the essence of a right. And I think that sometimes, even when there is a compelling or even an overriding reason, if it's the essence that's affected, it doesn't make any difference. And if I go abroad to the Supreme Court in the United States and the Riley in California case, there was a highly compelling reason, which was this guy was clearly a party to a murder, and yet, because his privacy and his Fourth Amendment rights had been violated, uh, that, that conviction was set aside, and the Supreme Court said privacy has a cost. And I'm not saying that the US courts have a concept of essence, I'm just saying that I don't see a role for compelling or overriding um, reasons when you talk about essence. And then third, I'd like to move into trims, which of course is the the, the core of this, and I hope what I'll be saying will be a bit different to Chris's um, perspective. 
Um, uh, the first thing that I, I noticed when I read it is you said that Schrems is rather unsurprising, given that the path was already pre paved in digital rights. Ireland and the, and the Court of Justice simply used the next contrary of reasoning. Well, yes, it wasn't surprising, and, and frankly, so did the parties use the sex contrary of reasoning. The EDPS was asked to intervene in this case, and I had the, uh, had the fun of being one of the agents for that. And when we were pleading it, we didn't have the benefits of a wonderful article like this. I really would have liked to have had it. Um, so what we did, and we didn't really know what essence was, so we simply read back to the court what it had said in DRI. And in Digital Rights Ireland, the court had said that privacy, the essence, hadn't been violated because there was no access to content. And you make the point, yeah, well, this is now rather difficult because uh, metadata can be just as bad as content, and that was addressed in Tele2 uh, Sphere. Yeah? Um, and what you do, you make a distinction uh, between judicial protection and privacy in Schrems that, that does give me a slight problem. I totally agree with what you say about effective judicial protection. There was a lack of remedies in the United States, and th th there was nothing. So, of course, that, was, that wasn't disproportionate. It was simply complete absence of, uh, of a remedy. And in fact, the lack of a judicial remedy has always been the fundamental sticking point in negotiations between the United States and the European Union. It was the one issue that was identified by the high-level contact group, uh, trying to prepare the way for what we now know as the umbrella agreement in law enforcement. It's the biggest, biggest weakness in the privacy shield that's replaced the safe harbor. And we will hear about it again when the latest Schrems reference on uh, standard contractual clauses comes to court. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an aside, as a parenthesis, by the way, I've never understood, um, uh, and this is for real fans of the US system, why the US hasn't done more with the PCLOB, the, what's it called, the privacy? Civil liberty Peace Oversight, Oversight Board. Board. Because if you look at the court case law of the Court of Human Rights, it does accept that even an administrative body, if it's a completely independent body, can count as a, uh, an independent tribunal. And if they're, I mean, you've still got the problem that in Charter we say it should be effective judicial review, but this is adequacy, not, not uh, yeah. the same. But anyway, that's a, that's a, that's a, don't let me go off on that. Now, where I quibble is, um, where you talk about privacy, because you give me the impression that you think the court really should have um, done, not talked about essence, but talked about disproportionate impact. And you saw this as an elegant way to avoid having to pronounce on, on foreign law uh, and factual circumstances in another country. Um, but I, I would, I'm going to cut a long story short here, I, I would just say, no, with respect, uh, there was a complete absence of, uh, of privacy in that case, too. I think the court was absolutely right to say that there was nothing, that the essence of the right of privacy had been um, affected. I thought it was actually a very accurate response, both to privacy and to judicial uh, remedy. And the open question after Schrems is, was there a failure to respect the essence of the right to data protection? The EDPS argued that there was. The Advocate General thought so, too, as you mentioned in your article. And um, uh, um, in, in reality, uh, when you look at the wording of the ruling, what has happened is the court in that case actually rolled data protection and right to judicial remedy together. You cited Article 95 of the ruling, and it's very interesting. If you look at that paragraph, it says the data subject did not have any possibility at all to pursue legal remedies in order to have access to personal data, hmm. obtain the rectification or erasure. And these elements are all there in Article 8, Paragraph 2, the charter. They're the fundamental elements of uh, data uh, protection. And so what the court has seemed to have done, it sort of built data protection into, um, into the, the, the ruling on the violation of the, uh, of the Charter. But I'm still sorry that it didn't actually uh, uh, rule on the Charter specifically. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say thank you, Maya. This is a great work of scholarship. I say I really wish we'd had it a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, and now that we've got Schrems, uh, as well as Alemo Heron, which you mentioned, which I'm looking forward to reading, I really, yeah, just read your summary, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people, including people working on this in Brussels, Luxembourg, and Strasbourg, 
who will greatly benefit from your article. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I think uh, I continue with the other Chris. Thank you. Well, indeed, it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to comment on Maya's paper. Uh, I have to say, in addition to being a professor here, I'm also editor-in-chief of a law journal, and I'm constantly looking at submissions. So I'm, I'm used to looking critically at articles. Uh, and I, I, I tend to be rather picky, I think, too, and maybe overly so. But I want to begin by saying that uh, I, I really enjoyed this article, and I think it's an excellent piece of scholarship. Uh, and I want to make that clear at the beginning. Uh, for several reasons, this is a, a topic, uh, the essence of the rights of, of data protection and privacy that all of us that work in this area are constantly encountering in court judgments and in papers, et cetera. And I've, I've long w wished that there was something like, like this article, uh, thinking I, I wish I could find, I, I wish there was some paper that really explains these, these concepts in the context of the courts judgments on data protection and privacy. And so I was very happy when I saw the reference to Maya's article and I downloaded it immediately and read it. So like, like the other Chris, I'm, I'm also kind of yearning, wishing that I had had this earlier, but, but we have it now, so we should be happy and not, not cry that, that we didn't have it in past years. Uh, I was very, I've been very impressed, Maya, by your really, the, the, the deep dive you do into the origins and jurisprudential uh, bases of the concept of the essence of rights. And I'm, I'm even a bit awed, I think, by your, your familiarity and ability to cite uh, materials in Polish and, and Slovak and other languages that, that I, I can't decipher. Uh, uh, and, and in particular, your, familiar, your clear familiarity with, with member state uh, systems of, of rights protection and national court judgments. Uh, and the way that you emphasize how the, the concept of essence has arisen from the constitutional traditions of the member states at the beginning, I think in particular, I, I really learned from it. And then as I, Chris has also referred to the, the, the German roots of this concept, which are also brought out very well. So you, you, you lay, the, lay the, uh, the groundwork very well, and then you, you, you clearly have a very deep knowledge of the relevant judgments of the court. Also, the, the, the doctrinal uh, arguments you make, I think, are, are, are persuasive. Uh, you also have a, a clear familiarity with the philosophical sources of the concept of essence, because I don't think this is a concept that can be really elucidated just by looking at case law. I think you do, you do need to get into, a bit into jurisprudence and, and philosophy of law, which you do. Uh, and it, it's also a very well-written article which I, I appreciate in particular. I found only one typo on page five. You, you, <laughs> say, you say bind, and you, but I think you, you wanted to say find, but I'm sure you've already caught that one. So that, that's already, I, I would have immediately accepted this article if it had been submitted to my journal. But I think you know, it, it, it's in, the, in the, na the, the nature of these kind of panels that we're here to kind of probe a bit and, and point out questions we have and, and even criticisms of the uh, of the paper at issue, and so I'm going to try to do that now. Uh, but again, keeping in mind this is this is I think a, a fantastic paper. Uh, one one of the, the 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 main points I have as a kind of as as a reader uh, is having uh, I think there's a little bit of a of a mismatch between the title of the paper and the the, the content in that from the, from the title and from the beginning of it. I, I got more of a sense that you were going to really focus purely on data privacy and, and the judgments of the court regarding data protection, but you don't really do that. You, you certainly refer quite a lot to the Schrems judgment as, as the sole judgment of the court where, the, where, where it did find that there was a violation of the essence. But then you, you really talk quite a lot about other other judgments. So by the end of the of the paper I felt a little bit like you were you were talking more in general about the the concept of essence, but you weren't focusing so much on on essence in the context of data data protection. So just this is maybe psychological as a reader, I I felt a little bit like I I, 
I wanted more elucidation with, uh, of the concept within the context of data protection. And in particular, the, 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 maybe an answer to the question, is there something special about the concept of essence as it relates to data protection and privacy, let's say, versus the concept of essence of a right as it would relate to freedom of expression or, uh, or any other fundamental right? Uh, so, but that, that's maybe just something, you know, it could be a slight tweak to the title probably and you could, you could solve, uh, solve that issue. Uh, another point is uh, uh, you, you, you mentioned, I think, quite a lot the Schramm's judgment and I'm, I'm not going to, to go much into the Schramm's judgment. I think Chris has already made a, made a number of points about it. And you, you state that you're going to, I think this is page 16, that, you're, that Schramm's is particularly important because it's, as I said, it's the one, the one judgment where there was, there was found to be a breach of an essence of a fundamental right. But I also thought, isn't it also, in, wouldn't it also be interesting to look at judgments where the court found that there wasn't a breach of the right to data protection and privacy. Can't we also learn from that? Um, because it seems to me that that would also tell us something about what the essence could be if we know what it, here is a breach of the essence, but here is a situation where there isn't a breach of the essence. And from that, we could maybe maybe deduce more about it. So I was, I was maybe expecting a little more of a systematic march through the, the, the judgments, of which, the, of course, there, there aren't many. Uh, and I know that I think this was published before the uh, opinion 115, which is the EU Canada PNR judgment. So you couldn't you couldn't take that into account. That's another case where there there was no breach of the essence, but it's, the issue is discussed. So I would have liked to see a bit more of a of this systematic examination, both of where there was a breach of the essence and where there wasn't. Uh, and this this leads to another point I have, which is I think you. Sometimes you, you you let the court of justice off the hook a bit too easily. Uh, I think this goes also to Chris's point about the Schrems, uh, where you, and I, I this it, it also struck me in that sentence that Chris Doxy mentioned, where you said, "Well, there was obviously, or, or this was a the breach of the essence here was an obvious consequence of DRI." And I wanted a little more explanation of why is that the case, and is that really the case? Or could there be criticisms of the court's approach there? I'm not going to go into that further, but um, it seems to me one of the key points of the essence, the, the, this concept of essence of a right, is the same that arises with proportionality, which you also discuss. And both of these concepts, and certainly I, proportionality has been very heavily criticized in academic literature. You, you cite quite a lot to the, to the book by, by Barak, which is one of my favorite law books ever. It's absolutely brilliant book and he, he goes through all the different criticisms. So it's, it's, a, it's a fundament of, of our whole legal system in Europe, but it's also something that's, that's subject to a lot of criticism. And, and I think the, the root of the criticism is often that, that how can you define the essence or, or of a right or, or when something is proportionate while you somehow uh, divorce this from the subjective views of the, of the, of the decision maker. So, there has to be a way for a determination of the essence of a right to be predictable and objectively determinable. And uh, that's something, th this is a point I think where the court's, the court's uh, determinations of there being an essence, a, a breach of the essence or not a breach could be criticized or questioned so far. Uh, a good example of this is, is mentioned by Orla Linsky in her book on, on the DRI decision where the court found there wasn't a, a, a breach of the right, of the essence of the right to data protection because of their, the, this, uh, the, 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 the data retention directive observes certain principles of data protection and data security and the court seems to ba base the, the essence of the right to data protection on data security. Uh, and I think that's that's something that that I would immediately that, that she questions, and I would immediately also question. Say, wait a minute, this isn't really you 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 can't really say the breach the essence of data protection is data security. That's not quite quite right. Uh, 
so and and also if you, I know you you couldn't deal with opinion 115, but I've I've recently annotated this judgment, and there's there's similar questions can be raised where they found there wasn't a breach of the essence of data protection with regard to to data transfers of PNR data to Canada because the court said this was just limited to certain elements of private life, in particular air travel between Canada and the EU, or, or the EU and Canada. But at the same time, later in the judgment, the court criticizes the, the, uh, the provisions of this draft agreement as they concern the processing of sensitive data and also criticizes the fact that there are insufficient protections for onward transfers of the data from the Canadian authorities to other authorities and other third countries. So I would immediately question the court and say, but this, this surely goes beyond just limited data transfers between the EU and Canada. It's, it seems that then the data could be transferred to other countries. So I, I think there is, there is a, a discussion to be had critically about the looking at, at sort of how is the court is now step by step making judgments about when there is a breach of the essence or not, and is this really, uh, really predictable, is it rational, uh, is it non-arbitrary? And at the moment, it, it's not really clear to me that the court has, has done a good job in laying out this in, in a very, very logical way. Uh, my final point uh, relates to something that, that Chris Doxey also mentioned, the, the multi-layered nature of the concept of essence and your, your, uh, uh, your analogy of an onion stuck with me the whole time as I read the article, like a, like a f smell of an onion. I had it on <laughs> me while I was reading this and I had it in my mind because it's such a nice image and so accurate, I think. Uh, but I, I, I also felt there was, there was a bit of an uh, extra uh, uh, arguments you could have made with regard to shrimps or extra points that you could have gone into. Uh, and this is maybe, it, it's maybe hidden a bit in, in the shrimps judgment. It's not so, so expressly dealt with, but the fact that the, the judgment is based on the, or, or one of the, the great holdings of the judgment is the court saying that, that uh, data transfers to third countries will depend on whether there's an equivalent or, or essentially equivalent level of protection in a third country, but not an identical level of protection. Now, uh, thinking about that, you would ask, what does this mean then that there's an equivalent or essentially equivalent level of protection? Uh, the court said that this is, this is not identical, so it can't mean that a third country has to have exactly the same wording in their law as in, in the EU law, but uh, does, this, does this mean the essence when they're saying equ essentially equivalent? Uh, I don't think it means the essence. I think it, it's probably the essence is a, is a smaller core, but it, it must be somewhere in between. But how does this, how does this concept of equ essentially equivalent lo level of protection relate to the essence uh, of the fundamental right? And this is also interesting because you see references in, in uh, for, for example, papers of Article 29 Working Party sometimes refer to core data protection principles. This is mentioned in, 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 in a number of papers. And when I see that, I also think, well, what are, is, are, do they mean the essence or, or do they mean something else? Or where, how is this core of data protection principles to be derived and who's, who, who is, Who's making the judgment about it? You know, who who is? I think the famous article by by Professor Leff of Yale said says who who is going to decide on these core principles? So we seem to have different layers of floating around. We have the the the, the essence. We have the core. We have the 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 whole uh, totality of of the of let's say the GDPR. And how do these relate to each other? Uh, I've, I've argued in a recent paper I did that we need to kind of talk up now about some sort of core of, of data protection, which is probably different than the essence. I think the essence is a clearly a legal topic and it derives from the, the charter, but we, we, we maybe need something a little more general and, and not so maybe legally defined uh, because otherwise I don't see how we can have a, a rational, predictable evaluation of third country standards 
if we're talking about, if, if we, it, it's necessary to use terms like the core of data protection, but no one knows what it means or, or what it derives from. Uh, very last point, uh, maybe for the future, interesting, uh, I think it's, it's interesting to relate or look maybe out, outside of EU law to the concept of essence as to how this could be derived from international law and human rights law. There's, a, there's an interesting reference in the Cadi judgment in, in paragraph 2A2 where the, the court is, is, there is, is defining uh, use cogens under public international law in, in a way that sounds very much like the way it would define the essence of fundamental rights. So there, there must be some sort of tie-in between the, the between essence of rights under the charter and and international human rights documents, but that's that would go beyond me to to talk further. So I, I've spoken a lot, and I think we're now all very eager to hear Maya's responses. Mm -hmm. Maya, I think I should give you the floor, although I have the feeling that I wanted to react as well. A lot of points being made, I will refrain from that, and I think it's uh, good for Maya if you uh, react. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I must say this is a very unusual format for me, and I must say that I like this format much better than the regular conferences because you really get input on the paper, and I would, of course, like to thank you for your uh, good points, I mean, your, your, your praise, but I would like to thank you even more for your criticisms because this is really what makes you think and what um, enables you to improve as a scholar and also improve your paper, which... I have just actually, I found this typo on page five. I've just submitted the <laughs> proofs yesterday <laughs> to the European Constitutional Law Review where the paper is going to be published. Send them an email tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, well, um, I think probably the most logical way would be to start from the back because what uh, Christopher has just said is... Uh, is quite fresh, so I would just uh, start with uh, with the last point. I will not really go into the Cadi question and and, and uh, question of uh, how international human rights instruments deal with essence. There is only international covenant on human rights that I have found, which actually mentions the concept of essence and how this has then been implemented, how this covenant has been implemented in the practice. Um, if we don't treat European Convention of Human Rights as an international instrument, then of course beyond that, I, I didn't look into that, but that would be of course another step uh, in the research. Now, I would say that your question on whether the protection of essentially equivalent standard is the same as the essence is probably the most difficult one of all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say uh, that pr just protecting the essence, with the essence of a fundamental right within the framework of essentially equivalent protection would not amount to the protection of essentially equivalent protection in my view. Mm -hmm. Because I think that Bit the so. essence is really... Oh yes, okay. uh, I, I believe that the, the, <laughs> if, if you, this is a fundamental right, and the essence is really a very small part of fundamental right, and yes. uh, I know that the result of my article and the result of the analysis and the test I propose is that in very, very few cases there will be a breach of essence. So I argue, for example, that in, in Schrems uh, there was no uh, breach of essence of privacy, but I will come back to that uh, on, on, uh, on the comment of uh, Christopher Doxy. Um, so I think that uh, the notion of essentially equivalent standard is more a standard of a level of protection and would encompass not only protection by, by fundamental rights, but also protection offered by secondary legislation. And the core or main or essential, or maybe I should use another term, uh, uh, principles and, and, and main elements of that secondary law protection. So I would say this, is, this would be the essentially equivalent uh, standard and I would not merge that, I would not, um, I, I would see these two concepts separately. Could I ask you a short question in between? Mm -hmm. Do you think that this core, is that something which uh, is the same as the elements of data protection in the charter, which have a few of these elements, or is it... Article 5 of the GDPR, which also have, has 10 principles. Do you think it's a bit like You this, mean for essentially equivalent yeah, yeah. standard? Um, yeah, I would see it uh, I would see it in that way. I would see it uh, in that way. But it's, it's really more a question of level. So um, uh, if, for example, in Europe, uh, the blanket retention of data is prohibited, then U.S. can only assure essentially equivalent protection if they also prohibit blanket retention of data. Like in Tele to Sverige judgment, it was very well explained, you know, if you don't focus specifically on people that are uh, potential uh, terrorist threat and you uh, collect data 
just in a general terms, this is something, this is the level of protection we want yeah. to have in Europe. Yeah. So US should also respect this type of protection, even though they express the protection differently, even though they have different mechanisms maybe, even though they put it under privacy instead of data protection, and even though they have different mechanisms of enforcement, this would uh, then still be uh, uh, essentially equivalent. Um, well, with regard to your um, criticism of proportionality and the question of uh, distinction between absolute and relative approach. I must say that there were very few authors uh, who uh, are in favor of the absolute theory and who actually recognize the essence as uh, something separate from proportionality and that they, they, most of the authors claim that any breach can be detected through the principle of proportionality and for any breach you can find an overriding reason uh, and then balance it within the proportionality principle. So Barak is also somebody who is very much against this uh, this concept of ex, uh, of, um, of essence, together with Alexei and together with other main scholars. The reasons why I think uh, this should be seen as a separate concept in the European legal order is first from the textual interpretation of the charter. So as you said, it clearly appears in Article 52. Uh, in a separate sentence as uh, proportionality. Uh, and secondly, the Court of Justice has recognized it in its case law, and I'm not referring here on the case law, dear I. Schrems, but to the earlier case law on very substance of fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. So actually, notion of essence was uh, included in the charter, that's what I argue, not only through common constitutional traditions of those uh, member states, uh, but uh, also and especially through this notion of very substance, which was developed in earlier case law, like Carlson, for example, and also uh, developed in the case law on citizenship, for example. There is also this Kerngehalt in German, but Wesensgehalt, mm -hmm. or, 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 or mm -hmm. Wesensgehalt, mm -hmm. which is a similar. Uh, which is a similar concept. So, so I know that I'm actually um, going into, I'm, I'm taking the, the position of a devil's advocate when I try to argue that uh, essence should be um, a separate concept. Um, let me just, I have made some notes um, about the title. Actually, the title has changed in the meantime, so I think <laughs> you still have the yes. working paper from Maastricht. Yes. The title has changed uh, in the meantime and is now actually more general. It now reads as the concept of essence of fundamental rights in the EU legal order, peeling the onion to its core, because I did want yes, to have a more general. Title. Yeah, thanks. And then I really want to have a more general view, but I am now um, going to a conference in Leuven organized by uh, Elise Mouyer where I will have to write on essence of data protection and privacy. Okay. So I, I am very grateful mm. for your comments on that and I'll definitely cite your uh, <laughs> annotation of opinion 115 which I couldn't uh, include in, in, the, in the paper. Um, so um, with regard to the question that uh, I sort of let the Court of Justice off the hook too easily, and I, I sort of say, okay, this is a logical, a contrary reasoning. Maybe I should have been more explicit in my paper and actually say that the problem started already in the Digital Rights Ireland judgment, because already in the in the Digital Rights Ireland judgment, uh, the court uh, found obviously that the data retention directive and the blanket retention, uh, retention of data was in breach uh, of the fundamental right uh, to privacy, but the court didn't really need to go into the question of essence. And I think that was kind of a slippery slope where the court um, took this path but, but slipped and it, it, and it actually took sort of a wrong conclusion because it, as it was explained later on in Delitus Sverige, the court somehow takes its position back and says, well, even the metadata can be problematic and even the metadata can potentially um, infringe even the essence, not just the content data. So I think that distinction between content data and metadata that the court created in DRI is extremely artificial because we know that, you know, if we have information about location and, and person who speaks and the duration of a conversation and we know what the relationship between people are, we can identify them. So it's not even anonymous. We can identify these people and we can have a lot of information about their private life. So I believe that uh, the problem started in, in, in DRI and then in, in, in Schrems the court sort of built upon that reasoning which was also not, um, not completely accurate. So for the protection of um, uh, fundamental right to uh, effective judicial protection, 
there I totally agree with uh, also Christopher Doxy that this was a correct reasoning and that the, the essence of fundamental rights was breached uh, because uh, the claimants didn't have any possibility to, to challenge that breach. For the, the privacy, uh, I think if the court had followed the test that I propose, and I, I'm not trying to be pretentious, you know, but if the court had, had, had followed this idea that essence is something separate for proportionality, then it, it could have come to a different conclusion, and actually it could have come to a conclusion that this was a disproportionate breach and not a breach uh, uh, which uh, would amount to a breach of essence. Now, the reason why I think the court didn't do it is because, because the overriding reason in Schrems was national security. But then we have to ask ourselves, whose national security was that? And of course, obviously, that was national security of the US. So I believe that the court didn't want to balance the US national security with the European, um, uh, with the European privacy and, and, and data protection rights. Uh, and that this is something where, uh, where the court sort of uses, uses uh, essence as a scapegoat in order to find its way uh, of reasoning uh, to say that, uh, that this is prohibited, that safe harbor is prohibited. Um, and that brings me also to the question of what about uh, uh, how the court sees uh, the data protection within the framework of the Digital Rights Ireland judgment. And I absolutely agree with Orla is that, that the court reduces that data protection to, to security measures. I even made notes uh, before I came here that these are, so the court reduces the data protection to technical and organizational measures and actually neglects the privacy part of the data protection. And this, of course, and opens the Pandora's box of what is the distinction between data protection as a fundamental right and privacy as a fundamental right. But I personally believe that those two rights are, at least to a certain extent, if not largely, uh, overlapping, and that the court neglected this idea that there is also a certain element of privacy in the, uh, in the data protection. So what the court actually says in, in paragraph 40 of DRI would be limiting data protection to this, what is called in the GDPR principle of integrity and, and confidentiality, okay. but in OECD principles that would be, for example, principle of data security. And if you look then into Tele2 uh, judgment, uh, where there the court has a very interesting reasoning because on one hand it, it, it uh, argues throughout the judgment uh, on the basis of both Article 7 and Article 8, and then at some point in Article 20, 120, uh, in paragraph 129 says, well, data protection is actually a separate right from the right to privacy, but it doesn't explain why and it doesn't explain how. But that's probably another, maybe we should close this uh, Pandora's very box. Very interesting discussion. Yeah. Yes, maybe yes, so I would be curious to hear your uh, views on, on that as well. So you have also mentioned that um, there are, that I should have included into analysis some judgments where, the, where there was no breach. So in, in this later version of my paper, I have done that to a certain extent, but you're right that it would be good probably to analyze them from a more conceptual perspective. So uh, there are uh, judgments like, for example, Spasic or Florescu, where the court has found that there was no breach of essence, even though it packed that into a little bit different terminology. So Spasic was a case where uh, there was a question of whether Nebis in Idem principle in Article 50 had been uh, violated. Um, and the claimant said that he has already had a penalty in another member state and that he doesn't need to uh, anymore uh, um, have this penalty in, in his own member state. And there the court said that um, this, uh, that he's right and that this limitation does not call into question the Nebis in Eden principle as such. So it doesn't sort of infringe upon the essence of Nebis in Eden principle. And similarly in Floresco, Floresco was a Romanian case where um, uh, the court had to assess uh, uh, Romanian legislation which prohibited um, the judges to also have uh, academic activities on the side. Uh, and um, uh, the judges were claiming that this infringes their right to property, and the court said that uh, this legislation did not undermine the very principle of a right to a pension. So this might have also answered uh, Christopher's questions about why do I use this weird formulation of calling into question the existence of the fundamental right. I have also drawn inspiration from this case law, more recent case law, 
uh, where uh, the court uses this formulation. But I absolutely agree with you. Maybe it's not. Uh, maybe the formulation could be a little bit could be a little bit different. But I'll I'll come back to that uh, as well. Let me see. Orla uh, I think that actually covers most of your comments. Thank you. But yeah. Thank you very much. Um, okay. I have a little to do list now. Cases to read. Yeah, it's a good article. Mm -hmm. It's good. So, yeah, the, 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 uh, with regard to um, Christopher, uh, this Christopher, Christopher <laughs> <laughs> Doxy. <laughs> I would like to make a link with what I have just said now. Uh, so uh, this explains the first part of the test. The second part of the test, um, I can see your point because uh, if I read now my, my, my article with your eyes, you could say, well, she's actually implying that the principle of proportionality has to be applied because you cannot talk about overriding reasons if you don't have principle of proportionality in the loop. And I guess this is how you understood it. But I th really think that we agree, it's just that perhaps I have uh, expressed myself in a way that could be understood also in a different way. So I believe that whenever we are um, establishing of whether there was infringement of essence, principle of proportionality can absolutely not be applied. And overriding reasons can also not be applied. So I could have just as well said the second prong, the prong of, the, of the reasoning is that um, principle of proportionality doesn't apply, but I think that that would be a, lot of, a little bit of a circular reasoning. And that's why I chose this wording that uh, principle uh, or essence is infringed if overriding reasons for such interference do not exist. So I think that we... Oh, but overriding seems a bit uh, proportionality test, or is that... Yes, yes, it does, yes, but that's why I'm saying that if you read it from the eyes of, okay, the moment we talk about overriding reasons, we are in the proportionality, then you can, of course, argue that. But if you say, like, there are no uh, existing overriding reasons, and if there are no existing overriding reasons, we cannot get to the principle of proportionality, then that's how I believe my test should be understood, and that's how I drafted it. Uh, but uh, but I see your point. So uh, so I think if if uh, overriding reasons don't exist, you don't even get into the proportionality balancing, and that's how that's how I see. It. Um, yeah. Then this difficult is to distinguish between objective and subjective um, infringement. I think perhaps. An example that is better than an example with the policeman for a subjective breach, because that's uh, it's quite an extreme example, and the question is whether we can even claim uh, whether a dead person can still say that his fundamental rights were, were breached, but that's <laughs> a <laughs> post-mortem post discussion <laughs> right that I wouldn't go into <laughs> now. Yeah, but maybe a better example is that um, if there's a particular group, not all right holders, if there's a particular group who's rights are taken away, then this essence of their right is infringed. For example, if we take the right to vote, um, and if we take away the right to vote to all women or all men. Like or, Mrs. Matthews. Oh, you, like you, Mrs. Matthews, yes, for example. Her, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that would be a typical example of you know infringing the, the essence of her and also the group uh, to which uh, she belongs. So that would be an and example of a subjective. Woman or was it? No, because she lived in Gibraltar. She lived in Gibraltar oh, yeah, and she right. couldn't yeah. vote for the... For the so that was yeah. a group. Yeah. yeah, or for example, Miss Goodwin first Mr. Goodwin, but then Ms. Goodwin, who uh, changed uh, the gender uh, operatively, and then she didn't have the right to marry a man. Uh, that's also a case where the court of, uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, said that her uh, right to essence, uh, her essence to the right to marry was infringed. Mm. Or, for example, the Baca case with the president of Hungarian Supreme Court, who had to step down and didn't have any remedy to challenge uh, that. That's also a case where the essence was infringed, where I think that um, the, the test is actually uh, implicitly applied. Uh, there are, of course, other cases of the uh, European Court of Human Rights where the court merges principle of proportionality with the essence. Um, and so the, the, the jurisprudence of the uh, ECTHR is not very clear on that. I'm not sure if there are some other issues that uh, you wanted to raise. This is basically what I have in my notes mostly. Did I... 
omit something? Yeah, I, I'm getting to your yeah. Uh, comments, okay. yeah. Um, so, uh, oh, your comment about the essence and, and, and dignity. So, uh, there are two parts to it. Uh, one part is that um, the explanations to the Charter uh, to the fundamental right to dignity uh, states in a way that dignity is enshrined in every single fundamental right. Now the second aspect is that I believe that dignity is not expressed in this, to the same degree in all fundamental rights. There are certain fundamental rights where this degree of dignity would be bigger and certain uh, rights where it would be uh, smaller, like the prohibition of torture, there obviously have a big element of dignity, uh, even rights to life, right to liberty and security or the right to non-discrimination. But then you have also other elements like the right to vote, the right to good administration, the right to petition, which would probably have a smaller element of dignity. And it is very important to observe that in Schrems, the court links uh, the fundamental rights to privacy with the rule of law. Hmm. The court states uh, mm -hmm. if, uh, if um, the... Uh, the, 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 the data subject is not given a, a remedy uh, in this case, then, of course, that infringes the essence uh, of the effective judicial remedy, but this is linked to the rule of law because uh, in a society where rule of law prevails, uh, such remedy would exist and should exist. And there I think we should also look not only into the question of dignity, but also into the question of all the values that are mentioned in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union. And there's an excellent article on this, linking the essence with Article 2 from uh, von Bogdandi and other authors in uh, Common Market Law Review, um, where he, um, in extremely detailed analysis, also links uh, fundamental rights uh, to uh, that, to those values. And I believe all those values are important also when we assess uh, the essence of fundamental rights. I initially, when I was developing the test, wanted to include those values also in the test as uh, that they would be breached as a consequence or that, they, or that that would be also one of the grounds while we would find the breach of essence. But in, in the end, I, I omitted that. Um, also mostly in discussions with, with the editors of, uh, of the European Constitutional Law Review, uh, which were also very, um, they had got some, got some really helpful comments from them, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, so yeah, you have <laughs> asked the question whether, whether there can be a breach of essence of the fundamental rights to conduct business. The case Alemo Heron was a case yeah, yeah. where the court actually says true. that... Uh, I find it quite strange, basically. It, it is strange, but I think what is very particular with Alemo Heron is that um, it's not that straightforward because the court is interpreting a directive uh, and uh, it's not actually doing a, a direct fundamental rights an analysis and the court only says that uh, the fact that you couldn't join this collective bargaining body mm. uh, as an undertaking is liable to affect your essence. So the, it's still not, you know, the, it's the a bit real. More the, distant from essence yeah, itself. Yeah, okay. so it's still, you know, liable. It's, it, there is a certain possibility, but the court doesn't say, like in Schrems, okay, the essence of freedom to uh, conduct business was really infringed in, in that case. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit lighter formulation, I would say. Please, I, had, uh, go I had ahead. another yes. question, the one I posted in the beginning. Mm -hmm. what, what could be the essence of the right to data protection if it's not data security? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there, I think, many people agree that the data security should not be the essence. But mm -hmm. what, should, what should be the essence? Yeah, I, I, and that's, that's where we come back to the discussion of uh, distinction or, or overlap between data protection and privacy. I believe that uh, in many cases, uh, a, a breach of essence of privacy would also lead to the breach of essence of data protection. And this, it is really a conceptual discussion. This is just something we've been discussing with my students uh, this week. Uh, and I really believe that those two concepts are, as I said, are, are, are overlapping. So uh, on one hand, we are criticizing the core that it doesn't make uh, a clear distinction between uh, uh, two fundamental rights. On the other hand, we are also not offering the court 
uh, elements on which it could base its analysis to make that distinction. Because if we look at the uh, case law of the Court of Justice, I think one of the rare cases where the court makes a clear distinction is the Bavarian Lager case, which was actually a case about access to documents with some elements of privacy. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, there are other cases where the court treats both uh, um, uh, rights completely overlappingly. And there are other cases where the court even sees data protection as a subset of privacy, because this is somehow the way the previous data protection directive has seen, um, has seen data protection as a subset of privacy. So I don't think it's a subset of privacy. I think that, uh, yeah, they're largely overlapping, but I believe that the court should also make it clear and, and, and sort of ad adopt a more constitutional and, and quite um, dogmatic stance on that issue mm -hmm. to, 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 to give a clearer uh, idea also to, to the scholarship of what exactly that means. Of course, bearing in mind that the GDPR is only based on uh, the fundamental rights to data protection, uh, and that's the only fundamental right that the GDPR actually uh, mentions, um, except in, I think, Article 52, when it talks about supervisory authorities, which should guarantee fundamental rights more in generally. There, you could also argue that the right to privacy should be included, but in general, GDPR is based on uh, on the data protection fundamental right. So, it's an ever-ongoing discussion. So I would be interested to hear uh, your views also, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, ever-ongoing discussion between specialists. What I want to say, what I would say about, uh, I, I agree that it fairly overlaps. I, that was, by the way, I wrote that in my thesis, that mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. overlapping, but it was the part of my thesis which was mostly criticized by everyone, basically, mm -hmm. because it is something completely different. It's about uh, control over your personal data is something completely different than privacy, for instance. There, there was really, this was fundamentally seen as mm -hmm. uh, something wrong by many, many scholars. Whereas other points where there was not so much discussion, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, I remember also with you, we had some discussions at this point. Uh, what I could say, you could say maybe that if you see the right to data protection as a right to fair processing, mm -hmm. then, is, yeah, then there is fairness would be the essence. But what is, does fairness mean in practice? You cannot uh, say that your yeah, that fairness is breached, basically. So there is a bit of an issue. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also think, and that was another part of the discussion we had, that uh, uh, some people say, well, data protection is basically a right to informational self-determination, the mm -hmm. former uh, the German concept. Yeah. And there, at least I, but also many other scholars say that that's not the case, because mm -hmm, it's something mm -hmm, completely mm -hmm. different. It's, you don't have a right to stop processing. You have a right that you process. You, data is processed in a fair manner. That's also part of this, this debate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could I say something there? Yeah. there? There's a very interesting book I'm reading now in public international law by Anthea Roberts called, called Is International Law International? And she, she uh, sort of, her, her thesis is that so-called international law is very much culturally determined based on legal system and mm cultural background, et cetera. And I wonder if we need to have the same discussion with EU data protection law. Is, is EU data protection law really EU, EU or what is, the, what is the influence of different, different legal systems? And we see this very much, I think, in the looking at the definition of data protection. If you, I mean, I, I've had all kinds of discussions with German scholars who immediately talk about informational self-determination and I say we'll go to the Netherlands and people will just immediately you know d d disagree with you and mention fair processing so we s maybe this is part of it as we we're sort of moving toward a more or we need to move toward a more European view of this and but we're still a bit captive to our own backgrounds and our, our upbringings and our legal systems well, that will be one of the biggest challenges I think for mm -hmm. all GDPR that it will be applied in a, and interpreted in a, in a uniform manner. That's the, one of the big challenges, and I think, I'm sure that on this case, things, many cases will pop up with the Court of Justice in the end, mm -hmm. which hopefully, or not hopefully, will uh, decide. C could I come back as well? Yeah. Um, 
Oh, oh, gosh, you've raised so, so many points. Um, the, 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 the legislator and the convention have given us some pointers about what's, what could be in the core. Um, if you look, I mean, the, the Articles 8, 2, and 3 of the Charter contain elements, um, not just access and rectification and erasure, but also purpose limitation mm -hmm. and consent. Uh, le legitimate reason. There was those that for some reason, I don't know why, the, but I'm glad they did, but the convention put those in. And the court hasn't characterized those, but it has characterized the right to independent supervision in Article 8, Paragraph 3 as an essential yeah. element of the, of the right. So if Paragraph 3 is an essential element, maybe the rights in Paragraph 2 yeah. are essential and part of the core as well. And the, the case, it's interesting you mentioned Bavarian Lager as the case where the court didn't run the two rights together. Um, I mean, that case was fun because Hilke and I were on opposing sides in that. <laughs> um, and uh, it was Hilke who was responsible in the, uh, the, the court of first instance for the, court, for the court of first instance accepting that privacy was the overriding criterion but the Court of Justice accepted that you had to actually read Article 41A, 41B of uh, Regulation 1049, um, where you say you, you, you have to look at the data protection rules if it's an access to document case, if it interferes with privacy or with the right of data protection as enshrined. So in that case, the court fortunately said that they were different because the legislation mm -hmm. made a difference, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. it, you don't see it anywhere else, but it's only you making that point that reminds me mm -hmm. of so it's it. It's a bit of a difficult case. Uh, if others want to join the discussion, by the way, please do. Uh, this is an open discussion. We are not with many people, so uh, please. Uh, we can have even more lively discussion with <laughs> less people, I think. <laughs> please say something if you feel like it. If not, uh, maybe we should put Willem on the spot a bit because I see you there with a very very intense look on your face. What, what is your reaction to all this? Maybe we can get the discussion going too. You take the microphone. By the way, indeed, yeah. Honestly, uh, I haven't had a chance to read it right. So for me, it's very difficult to Data security. Yeah, so. data security also, but also the most the right to live. Uh, at, at, from this moment where we are confronted with, is always uh, the, 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 the safety question, huh. and um, that is of course for us also important to, to, to look out. Can you make? Um, can you use these concepts? Maybe I'm going too 
far from the essence of the article on the essence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the of course, when you are staying as a, as a data protection authority, when you are coming to the legislature, when you are coming to the public, to the mass media, you are always confronted much more with this uh, question. Uh, uh, but, uh, sorry, I haven't read the article because uh, uh, maybe no, I put it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yes, of course, uh, uh, for us, the crucial question to, to answer and to, to discuss. Mm -hmm. I think still, uh, I think what you say is very relevant because basically that, that is what we talk about. And in public discussion, it always goes about privacy versus uh, security versus safety of human beings. And the question is, of course, if you take the approach of Maya of the absolute uh, of the absolute nature of the essence of fundamental right then there is elements where uh, the notion of the need for security cannot prevail basically I think mm -hmm. there, there must generalized access of to uh, generalized access to to uh, content data if you, if you follow the court and maybe also the reasoning of Oh, yeah, but maybe she doesn't say that, means that you can never access the content of data uh, on a generalized manner, even in situations which are life-threatening. I don't agree with that. Okay. Good. No, no, I, I don't agree with that. I think that, that there are some situations in That's which That's your you overriding uh, interest. Yes, that would be our overriding interest, which would be maybe the... In the, 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 the well, uh, yeah, now that I think that it's actually generalized, but how can you have generalized collection with a particular emergency situation? That's what I don't see, because you would need to collect the data before the emergency situation yeah, exactly. arises. Exactly. But, but if you have within the context of an emergency situation, so if you have, I don't know, a context of, of war or... Yeah, yeah that's, that's, I'm on a very shaking ground there, because I know that if, for example, you have terrorist threat uh, in, 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 in red, uh, number number five terrorist threat, can you then still have a generalized collection of data or, or not? Yeah. It's very difficult, I think. But I think the, the argument that uh, the, uh, the other elements of Article 2 uh, of uh, data protection fundamental right um, uh, of Article uh, of uh, the other elements of uh, fundamental right to data protection in Article 8 um, I think that's a very good uh, example that would uh, lead to the breach of essence of data protection. So if you have, for example, processing without any legitimate ground, not on the basis of consent, but also not on the basis of uh, contract, not on the basis of a public interest, that I think could lead uh, in the end to uh, the breach of essence of the data protection. So if you have collection without any um, without any legitimate uh, ground, then that could, I think, be an infringement of the essence of data protection. Do you agree? Yeah, I think it's a very useful thinking. Uh, and, uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> now, the, 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 there was a lot of criticism, mainly from police circles, but people with security circles, on, on the Tele2. Uh, judgment exactly because it says generalized access to data is not possible and you can uh, uh, if if something happened if there is a terrorist attack at a certain moment you cannot from that moment on after the attack start collecting data now you need to have them in advance and if you if you're not allowed to have to have all communications data then you you really uh, cannot prevent big uh, threats, big, big attacks. That was one of the big uh, criticisms on, on, mm -hmm. on Taylor 2. Mm -hmm. By some people, others thought that this was fantastic, of course. But yes. well, may I say something about him? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Sometimes it was a smoking gun also to, to, to have to 
you improve. And the more and more you are in criminal uh, cases, you have to, to give evidence. Mm -hmm. If it's really uh, hard evidence, the more and more you are obliged as a prosecutor, also as a judge, to take into account hard facts. And hard facts, for example, it's not only payments, uh, Also mention your name. This, this was, by the way, Willem de Beukelaar, the head of the Belgian Data Protection Authority, which you probably know. Who are you? I think that's probably more a question for. You want to for, respond, uh, Chris? Or? Yes, let me just give some responses off the top of my head. I think what you raised is is a a good example of a situation where it's necessary to step back a bit uh, and look at the the totality of the legal order, the, the global legal order. So we're we're talking here very much about EU law, and we're looking sort of inwardly at the EU legal system, but of course the EU is part of the global legal order and there's also public international law. So, uh, and, and this is, to me, this is one of the big overriding challenges, legal challenges of the next few years is how to, how to marry the two of them because there's, there's, there's a lot of tension between them, there's conflict, there have been some cases of the court of, of justice that have showed that very clearly. Uh, so you can ask, for example, how do we ensure then the rule of law uh, globally? But that's very hard to do with regard just to EU rights because there you, you immediately run into international issues of international law too about applying EU law or in 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 third countries, which would to to ensure all of the enforcement that we have in Europe would immediately probably breach the sovereign rights of of other countries. So I don't think there's a clear legal answer to this now, but, um, and it's, it's probably not something that can be solved through the kind of technical dogmatic uh, legal approach. It, it would require somehow marrying or, or, or maybe specifying more the, the what, what sort of role does the EU law want to, want to play in the global legal order? And I think the I think EU law is struggling with this now. We've seen different, as I said, tensions and, and cases involving conflicts between them. But I don't I don't think it I, I don't think EU law knows this. I, I wrote a a paper which is going to be published now in a book called the Global the Internet and the Global Reach of EU Law, which deals exactly with this. Um, 
but I, I don't think it's it's. I mean, we can we could solve it from the EU law point of view, in a sort of dogmatic sense within EU law, but. I don't think it's it's that's really meaningful because it doesn't it may not be effective in in a global sense. So I could go on about this and it's, it's a difficult topic to to discuss. I don't know. The, the rest of you, please please chime in. I, I suppose this is the the Schrems case is a case that brings this also to 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 light very much. And and you know in in the Schrems case, the court did kind of solve it from the. EU law point of view, but then you could say, all right, but uh, what about from the, the larger global perspective? Uh, and I, I don't think there's a clear answer to that now. Which, uh, which uh, probably this discussion will continue now with the follow-up to the Schrems case. Now uh, the privacy shield has been challenged twice mm -hmm. before the general court. In one case, uh, the court said that um, the case is inadmissible and the other case is still pending. So this is also, uh, on one hand, we have to see whether the general court takes a different approach from the court, and on the other hand, we also have to see how this would impact globally uh, also the, the, the data protection regulation uh, and, and the data protection regime in Europe and elsewhere. I was uh, at a conference in, uh, in Washington um, in February, last February, where a privacy shield was somehow praised uh, by the EU official as a big success. We also know that it has been very much criticized by uh, legal scholars and by privacy uh, activists. Um, and um, I believe that uh, if the court strikes down again a privacy share, then globally we will have uh, a legal and a policy problem as to how to solve this conundrum. And, and, and I'm afraid that if the court strikes down the privacy share, there will be no privacy shield at all because it would be impossible to mm. negotiate something that offers a higher level of protection if you look at it a little bit from the US perspective and that will create uh, a global problem I believe there's also in the, in the questions that are referred now yes. uh, there's at least I think two one there, there are 12 and there, there's yes, yes, yes. Shams, uh, new Shams case. yeah this yes, new yes, new yes, case and yes. there, there's a there's a question about essence or, or it's sort of a two-part question, so mm -hmm. the court will have to opine further on that. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a new, new case brought by SRIMS on the, uh, the standard contractual clause yeah. for transferring. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To what extent are they compatible with, with the charter and a few other questions around it. So that, that's, but that's, uh, that case has just been brought to the court next, last week, so it will take some time before we get clarity mm -hmm. on this. I thought your question was a bit like an onion, actually, because <laughs> <laughs> it had, you know, there's lots of levels to it. I mean, one level is there are some fundamental differences between the EU system and, and some others and, and others. If you compare the OPEC, uh, sorry, OPEC, APEC, APEC. 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 Um, now I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of the the guidelines, the OECD guidelines, OECD guidelines yeah. and the systems that follow that one way, you, you, there is no need to have a legal ground for processing, whereas the EU rules stress that. So there are some very fundamental um, differences uh, that would, would, you, know, you, have to, you have to look at when, when, when you know, how, how far, it's not just a question of whether there's essential equivalence or, or not sometimes. Um, the, uh, the only thing is that the, the Canada case may have given us some, um, uh, and I'm just thinking this purely on the EU side now, I'm, I'm being very yeah. narrow, may have given us some help because a lot of this has to be solved by negotiation. And the negotiations, the EU negotiators have always had the problem dealing with other countries that they take steady state law. They say, right, we'll have an agreement and we'll try and do something, but we refuse to legislate to do anything on our side, we have to find. So you have the safe harbor, which is a remarkable construct based on the powers of the FTC for misleading advertising and so on. But there was one thing in Canada which people haven't emphasized in the EU, Canada PNR, where uh, and it's, you really see it in, in the commission's observations, which were taken in the advocate general's opinion, which is that um, uh, the, the privacy commission in Canada had had has jurisdiction over almost everything, but not us here in Europe. You know, we've been to Canada, we've come back, but 
once we're out of Canada, there's, there's this bit which they don't have jurisdiction of. You have to have, be there. You, know, you complain while you're there and you're okay. So they set up a sort of tribunal, which they thought was sort of independent enough. Hmm. Uh, but it was administrative, so it didn't fit the criteria of independence of a data protection authority. And the court said, that's not good enough. You can't have that. There's this essential element of independent supervision. And I just wonder whether that could be used, I'm just thinking now on the EU side, by negotiators, because we never had that power before, is to say, right, if you're going to make an agreement with us now, and you want to do essential equivalence, adequacy, you want to call it, you have to think about legislating. And, and you know, there's a gap here. We can no longer find a, a fudge that, that tries to, you know, get over it. You know, we've got to negotiate this and, and get it right. So, I mean, EU Canada, you just need to read Chris's article on it, it's so full of rich um, mm. help. I mean, because the, 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 the parliament said to the court, is there specifically anything wrong with this? Uh, they were very, very, Yes. following what they gave Very us. But, you know, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of guidance in that, that that could help in answering your question. I think yeah, time for a cup of tea. this was a very fruitful discussion. And before others also leave the place, I think uh, we should uh, uh, end it. I find it very, very interesting and lively. I hope, uh, Maya, that you have had something. Mm -hmm. On it, and you can. Excellent. There's this wonderful conference for those who are still here in Leuven. I think it's 17th or 18th of May, on exactly, but then much wider on the essence of fundamental rights. I think even yeah. Leonard, the the president of the European Court of Justice, will be there, and uh, Maya as well. So important <laughs> people, <laughs> and uh, on exactly these kinds of issues. And I think your task there is to talk about. Uh, fundamental right to privacy and data protection, yes. so yeah. that could be, I hope we could help you to give you some ammunition for Definitely. this. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for those few brave of you who, because outside I think it's much warmer than here, I'm here, I have, <laughs> I have some, some cold air behind me, so I think uh, we should go and find the heat. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.